What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Sheehan Show here on Sherdog.com. And we have the big pay-per-view from London coming up this weekend. And who better to get on to speak about that than the best MMA journalist slash media member slash analyst based in London right now, Harry Powell, to talk about the main event. We're not going to give this a full preview, but what we are going to look at is the main event, bit of analysis on that. I'm going to pick out maybe two to three of the uh, other UK stars on the card and tell you a little bit about them, uh, especially Christian Leroy Duncan, because I'm a massive fan of Christian Leroy Duncan. Uh, but we're, we're going to get into the uh, the main event first and talk about that. Har- Harry, how are you today? Are you, uh, I know uh, we, we were both kind of talking briefly before this about watching back this fight looking back on it in, in terms of the level of um enthusiasm for the rematch in terms of how excited you are i know it's a little bit different when you're in the place like when bellator comes here it's very different for me how is it for you with uh, london coming up is, is are the levels of excitement a little bit different than they I suppose normally would be so when we had the london card in march last year there were posters everywhere it was really really well marketed and and you could sort of feel a bit of a buzz about the place as that weekend was coming round um i am not seeing the same level of attention here um and i think some of that is because leon usman uh, leon and usman as a as a matchup isn't compelling in its storylines that have been told so far but to the hardcores and to me specifically i'm i'm actually really excited because going in we sort of had the idea that Usman was the far superior grappler and we could see sort of five rounds of dominant grappling and it may be a little bit boring. It may not be what we expected it to be. It may not be the the homecoming fight that, that Leon wanted. And then obviously the insane finish happens and it sets up sort of this really intriguing battle coming out next time where Usman has come off being finished and finished devastatingly after being so dominant in so many fights. Leon manages to finally claim that title after having such a long route to that title shot. He's doing it in his own backyard and there's this all this sort of fervor around it. And we'll get to the analysis, but I think from a from a fighting perspective, this rematch is even more interesting than than the first fight was going to be. Yeah, I, th- I think it is. And from like the London perspective as well, there there was that initial, oh, we want it in Wembley Stadium. It's a big pay-per-view. It's going to be all this. That didn't happen, obviously. Uh, you know, Paddy Pimblett's not on the card as well. There's a couple of the other stars, a couple of like Darren Till would have been a guy. I think a lot of people would have liked that. And obviously, he's not even in the UFC anymore. But um, it, it just, it is a very good card. And we, we, we look through it. And I'm sure that, you know, the lads will break it all down in the preview show as well, especially, you know, the co-main event as well, Gaethje and Fiziev, which, is a fight that I think no matter where you are in the world you'd, you'd like to have so but it, it does feel like it's kind of maybe slightly missing let's say if the, the third and fourth fights were big UK fights a big Paddy Pimble fight a big Darren Till fight a big Arnold Tom Allen Aspen. fight you know what, what were you saying there? Tom Aspinall yeah Aspinall exactly and it, look injuries and, and circumstances have obviously not allowed that but the UFC as well like I think there is a little bit of uh, to blame there with not getting the stadium show done and not stacking that card in the way maybe they should, but that's the uh, that's the way the UFC is running at the moment, and <laughs> I I think we've uh, we've probably discussed that into the into the ground at the, uh, over the last few years uh, since the the whole oversaturation came in, and this is just another another uh, side to it, even at the very very top. Anyway. Edwards versus Usman. I, I have so many questions after just going back. Uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, I watched the whole fight back. And just now before we started, I watched parts of rounds just to see a few keys. Uh, the one thing I went back to watch it for, and I, I'm interested to hear your take on this, is did anything change in the fifth round? To, so, And I asked that question because I always say about the three fights from last year that were... Um, the three big fights that all ended in the fifth round, the um, the light heavyweight title fight. This fight in general is, you know, is, is one of them. And uh, what, what was the other one? Oh, God. Uh, what was it? Is he in Pea? Yeah, is he in Pea? No, and is he in Pea one is the example because to me, that was a clear adjusting in uh, Israel Adesanya's uh, style 
that he had in the first four rounds. Whether it was a mental or physical thing, we can decide that. But there was a clear difference in what he did there for Glover to share. I know you've talked about that a, a, a good bit as well. He kind of gave that away in some ways. Now, is that fatigue or mental or more fatigue, I think, than mental probably on that side? But for this one, I feel like it wasn't actually discussed that much from Usman's point of view. And I think a lot of the nonsense came, and, and I truly mean nonsense, because... A lot of people were saying, oh, you know, Usman's corner talked him, or sorry, uh, Edwards' corner talked him before the fifth round. They gave him this big pep uh, pep talk and all this, and he went out and he knocked him out. I, I just, I hate that sort of stuff. I, don't, I didn't believe in that for one second. He went out there, he set it up, he threw it, and he knocked him out. And it was Edwards more so than anything that caused that. And we will talk more about that in a second. But for Usman, was there like was there an Adesanya drop off that you saw? Was there an adjustment, a key that f- allowed him to find himself in a position where he's never found himself before? Not really, but that's not to say it didn't happen. You know, like for for Israel Adesanya, like it was written all over his body language, and it was as plain to see as possible. There were three methods he was using to to sort of escape from Bahia's pressure, and he would he in the fifth round he just did none of them. And and Bahia obviously went over and took the chances that were presented to him. Fine, no problem. For Leon and, and Usman, I mean, only Leon will be able to answer as to whether he'd seen that head kick throughout the fight and just pulled the trigger in the fifth, whether the corner gave him that little extra bit of confidence to go out there and, and throw that head kick, or whether he just saw it right there in the moment, threw it, that was it, and and, and we were done. But for Usman as somebody who is really good at keeping a poker face, right? That's one of Usman's traits where throughout the fight, he doesn't give much away sort of in his body language or in his, in in his face. I didn't see something necessarily, but when you look at how the shot lands, Usman's clearly got that hand dropped. He clearly, uh, Leon sees it and, and sets up that head kick and throws it. Is that a, I'm four rounds up here. And I'm, I'm kind of cruising and things are going to be okay. And this guy can't hurt me because Leon's not known to be a big puncher. And so let me maybe lose a bit of mental clarity here. And, and here we are in a way where we're staring up at the lights. It's very, very hard to say. I would tend to agree with you. I don't think there was anything obvious. Like the, the one small thing I would say there was, a oh, well, um, the, the, the big thing is that he didn't get the takedown. I suppose, and that's the only thing. But that's not like him dropping off necessarily. If he did drop off, I think the small thing probably was a, like a a slight lowering of the amount of shots he was throwing, if you want to put it that way. But like that's going to happen in the fifth round anyway. I don't think that's necessarily a big thing. So, you know, if you're, you know, giving out the credit here negatively or positively, I think you have to kind of go with the positive way here and say Leon Edwards set this up executed it, landed it, and knocked Usman spark out. So to go back and watch that fight, it's very interesting. Now, maybe maybe before we, we move on to the next fight, just to go over maybe the rest of the fight as well and, and see is there any keys, anything that, that stood out. There was a couple of things that, that stood out for me, me. The takedown of Edwards, obviously, we you know, everyone has kind of talked about that in, in the first round, massive. But then the ability for Usman to come around and then get his own takedowns in three of the next uh, four rounds, which uh, which he did very well. And it was a big key to winning the fight, you know, because it was relatively even on the feet at times. But Usman, I think, was ahead most of the time. And in the takedowns with the ground upon, obviously, secured the rounds. First on that for you, Harry, how big of a key was that? And I want to talk a little bit about the striking afterwards, but the wrestling of Usman versus the wrestling of Edwards. And here's here's a question. Could Edwards see what happened in the first round in this fight and think that is maybe a key? Maybe that's, that's, maybe that's the five-round game plan. Maybe I need to be more proactive with the wrestling throughout. And now it was from a body lock. It was from a clinch. It was a great takedown. It wasn't just like a single leg or a double leg or anything like that. But is that something we could possibly see here from uh, Edwards? I think, and again, there is, as MMA media, as, as fans, whatever, we are going to, I'm going to tangent slightly, allow me, I'll come back. Like, we are going to be looking at that Alexander Volkanovsky Islam Akashev fight for the next five years, like, and we're going to be learning things from that fight as we go. I think Leon looks at Alexander Volkanovsky and he says, oh shit, 
if I threaten the takedown on Usman, which is something that Colby Covington did once in their in their bouts, and what happened? Both of them had this standoff, like that Spider-Man meme where they're all pointing at each other, right? And then there was a moment where they kind of agreed not to do this because they might gas each other out or it could be a whatever. We saw in Makachev and Volkanovsky, when Volkanovsky tried to counter-wrestle, even just to offer it as a threat, Makachev had to consider it and he had to defend it. That allowed Volkanovsky to have a little bit more space, a little bit more respect from Islam. And if I'm Leon Edwards, I have the confidence that I actually was able to get this man down. Okay, did we do significant amount of damage on the floor? Did we control him for long periods of time? No, fine, no problem. But we look at that Islam Makachev and, and Volkanovsky fight and we say, okay, a very dominant wrestler can be perturbed by you trying to fight him at his own game, not giving him the respect that he believes he deserves in his own game. We talked off air about pressure and I feel like pressure can be multifaceted when it comes to these sorts of things. But if I'm Leon Edwards, one of his absolute pivotal parts in his game is his clinch game. He is fantastic in the clinch with his knees. When he breaks and he lands elbows, fantastic. Let's see. Go clinch him. Go clinch him. Clinch him in the middle of the cage. Clinch him against the fence. Get your reversals with an underhook and your and your uh, your collar grip. And start landing. Threaten takedowns. Look for him. Look for sweeps. Look for off balances. And obviously, we saw against Gunnar Nelson, if you have to break, if you don't feel like you're getting where you want to, land that elbow. I think one thing we might take from the fifth round as well is that maybe Leon Edwards has a cardio advantage over Usman. Because like we, we've heard an awful lot as well about Usman's knees and, you know, Rogan was talking about a few different people that he has bad knees and he's not able to run and all. Like whenever we hear that about someone, it does affect their cardio. Now, as I said again, it, it wasn't an obvious thing in the fifth round, but it was obvious that he, Leon was going very well uh, in the fifth round. Okay, he was down and all, but... He was going very well for a guy who'd been taken down and probably top control for maybe, what, 10, 11 minutes of that fight. The fact that he showed that, like, push him against the cage for four, five, six minutes of the first two or three rounds. Hold him there. P- push his cardio. Test it, because you know you can pass the test. Can Usman pass the test? I, I, You know, maybe Usman from two fights ago, three fights ago, four fights ago could, and maybe he can uh, next Saturday. But can he, you know, have the injuries uh, mounted up? I think that is a big thing coming in here. And one other big thing that I really want to talk about before we get into more of maybe the striking and how we generally think the fight will go. You mentioned the word confidence there. And I just wonder how that will affect this fight. Because, as I said, that's not that's a thing I very rarely even talk about in fights like this. Because I remember the, the McGregor-Aldo fight. And everyone was, oh, he's in his head, he's in his head. And okay, he did knock him out in 12 seconds or 13 seconds or whatever it is. But I never bought into that for a second. I never bought in, into it in most of these fights. But these lads just fought each other a few months ago. And one lad ended up winning the championship and having the biggest confidence boost he's ever had and one lad ended up on his back prone looking up at the lights knocked out for the first time in his career how do you think that will affect both of them coming in here like is it is it a simple case of leon's going to be up and usman is going to be down or can are is it going to be the same what, what do you think so i'm just going to circle back to some of the points and add add, add some thoughts like Usman himself has come out before and said he has to walk downstairs backwards because his knees knees. don't work, right? And I don't know. I really don't know why. I mean, I do know because it's the wrestling, right? But I don't know why fighters aren't smashing the legs of Kamara Usman more. And look, I get it. The wrestling is there. And if you throw low kicks at the wrong time and you get taken down, that's a problem. The other side of Leon and the cardio, I think in some way it plays to Leon's advantage drastically. And in some ways I do think it hinders him. He is probably the most economical fighter that we've seen in the UFC coming from oh, for a long time. I mean, Volkanovski probably is up there, right? But he never takes a risk. He doesn't have to. He is so happy to just chip away and chip away and chip away and win rounds and win rounds decisively, but to do it in his own way. 
It's not, he's not going to go out and try to hit the, the right hand that, that Usman lands on Jorge Masvidal unless it's right there in front of him. And that, I think, adds more credence and more stock to the head kick because he obviously throws it because he sees it and it lands with devastating effect. But he's, uh, in some fashion, when we look at the, the, the four rounds previous to the fifth, what we need to see a little from Leon, I think, is some haste to get back up. Because if he trusts in that cardio so much and we'll get to the strike and we'll get to the footwork and we'll talk about pressure, if you are so confident, just go hell for leather, just like Volkanovski did. He did it in the right way. He didn't make any mistakes. Fundamentally, from the knee and elbow principles, from the neck principles to the head height principles, hip height principles, he adhered to all of them, but he didn't fuck around waiting for one second. And I think if I'm Leon Edwards, I'm like, I know I can do 25 minutes. If we went back and we put Leon Edwards in those old UFC fights, which were 30 minutes, one round, he would decimate fellas. He would just exhaust fellas and then wouldn't even need to finish them. They'd just be over and he'd just land one shot and it's done, right? But I think just to answer the confidence point, we can play this two ways. We can say Leon Edwards can look at himself and be like, I knocked this motherfucker out, I could do it again. But Leon Edwards can also say, well, I kind of lost four rounds of this fight and I just so happened to find this head kick and I put him away. Kamaru could say the same thing. He can come in and be like, fuck, I've just been knocked out for the first time and this is horrendous and how am I going to get back from this? Or he could say, I dominated this dude for four rounds. He found a Hail Mary head kick and I'm just going to go in to his backyard and I'm going to absolutely put a beating on him. Um, and I understand that you know, I'm going to use the word that you hate, right? Confidence is an intangible. You can't measure confidence, right? How, how do you do that? You put it in a pot with a measuring jug and you sit like, it's impossible. And at the end of the day, these are the elite of the elite fighters. They are all f***ing confident, right? But I, uh, yeah, the confidence part is really interesting. Really I, interesting. I think it's a massive key because, and it's only a key that we'll, do you know what's a key probably won't even discuss afterwards? It's, it's one of those things you only kind of discuss coming in, but I, there's a couple of fights that always stand out to me. And the, the one, and I was only talking about it recently, and we, you know, we mentioned McGregor Aldo, but Jose Aldo against Frank Yeager in the fight after McGregor. I know. I think it was Ryan O'Connor, when the guy who used to cover MMA in Ireland here, he put up a video of all the times that Frank Edgar tried to hit Jose Aldo and he missed. And he was like, Jose Aldo got knocked out in 11 seconds or whatever it was in the last fight. He decided not to get hit in this fight, <laughs> you know, and he went 25 minutes and I, I, I'm going to use this word clean. It was the most clean win in USC history, just uh, over 25 minutes, the most destructive, just classic technical, tactical destruction we've ever seen. And like, does Usman have that in him? Like, that, uh, I, 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 I think he does, right? But does he? Like, can, that's why Jose Aldo is special. He's one of, you know, he's one of the top ten best found found fighters of all time. Maybe fifth, you know, maybe maybe up there. I wonder, does he have that in him? But not many people have that mental ability, and that's why I thought it was bullshit as well with the whole oh McGregor's and Aldo's head type of thing. Because you look what happened with Aldo afterwards, and I think he poo pooed all of that. It was just a great punch on a on a great night for a, a great fighter against another great fighter. I wonder, I wonder, 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 can Usman do that? And like, there's, if you say you look at it, we look at it in a way, it's probably positive for uh, Edwards, probably negative for Usman. But what if it's the other way around? Like, what if Edwards is like, oh, I'm the best in the world now? What if he doesn't do that extra mile of running? What if he doesn't do that extra session? Right? And I'm not, I'm sure he isn't. But what if, right? And what if Usman said, right, I've been the best, I'm the best in the best, and suddenly I'm knocked out. Oh, I got to change things up. I got to do, I got to run through those fucking bad knees, and I got to do that extra session. I got to do that extra mile and all of that. That could change the fight. But like, that key to me is like, if... Ed, if Edwards fights the exact same way as he did the, the first time, and if Usman fights the exact same way as he did the first time, I think Usman wins the fight. And I think most people w would agree with that. It was a big head kick. Will it happen again? Pro you know, probably not. But if there is like a slight drop off from Usman, I don't think Edwards will have changed that much. And I think he will be able to be there and take advantage of that drop off. So that's from the mental point of view. The last thing I want to talk about is just, okay, the striking, but the overall 
part of the fight. Now, I, I look at him, we were talking about it, as, as I said briefly beforehand, and one key, I think, is the feints of Usman. That, like, he throws these big, obvious feints and then comes with the big shot after it, or throws maybe two big feints in a row. I just feel like that's that's something after fighting him. I, I know they fought before, but fighting this version of Usman, that you'd be very well able or are better able to deal with the second time especially haven't gone back and watched it because it just feels like if you can not bite not bite not bite and then when he throws bite that's the key i think to beating usman it's also the key to not getting clinched by usman it's also the key to not getting taken down by usman it all comes from there because if you bite on a clinch you're in an area where he could push you against a cage clinch you and take you down if you can not bite on that feint you get into a place in the pocket where he can double leg you and possibly take you down. It's a very brave thing because you're saying, okay, I'm not going to bite in the clinch and suddenly he kicks you in the head or suddenly he jabs you right down the middle. It's it's a brave game. It's it's a tough game to do, but I think that's a massive key for Edwards. He probably needs to, to like fight in a way to do that, which isn't normal for him. He probably needs to fight a step back rather than, as you said at the start, it's probably a step forward. So maybe, like, Maybe you need you need to do that thing where it's a, a defensive step forward and an uh, an offensive step back, you, and you need to maybe be in those two modes. Uh, but it's like that's a tough thing to do as well when you're such a well rounded mixed martial artist. And the key to Leon Edwards being great, I think, is the well roundedness, the the cardio, the the striking, the jujitsu, the, the you know the 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 the, the, the defensive and offensive tactics, and to kind of ask a guy to like you need to be defensive here only you need to be offensive here only i think is a very tough thing to do and i and like i don't think it'll honestly happen but what do you think of that first of all and what do you think the key to maybe the striking battle to stop the, the striking battle to win the strike metal and in the strike metal maybe to stop the clinch and take down so i think the fully on edwards i agree that the answer is to jam usman right it's to not buy on feints and then when you know he's going to throw to jam him with something. Leon's got a really, really solid front and back teep. And that can be very, very useful when Usman has committed to something. Because when you commit your center of gravity to move, it's going to be hard even for an athlete like Kamar Usman to gobble up that teep, immediately wrap it into a double leg and take you down, right? Because Leon Edwards is, is an athlete himself. And, you know, this is where we are. Both of them have good jabs. I would argue that Usman's jab is probably a little cleaner and a little crisper as that's been the main weapon that Whitman has sort of instilled into him. And he hits that jab at a really nice angle. He feints off, he circles off, he moves in and then he splits that stance quite wide, dives in and and hits that jab really cleanly. He can also use that split stance as a penetration step to his double legs, his single legs, if he wants to. And I think that's where so much of the success comes from the jab is because you can meld it not just as a jab, but as an entry into into his his wrestling exchanges. For Leon, I think to to force or to, to make it safer for himself to commit to strikes when Usman commits, we need pressure. John Jones went out against Cyril Gunn and said, whatever you do is bollocks. I don't give a shit what you've got. I don't care how powerful you are. I am going to nullify you by drowning you in pressure. And I think if I'm Leon Edwards, and this is, he's going to have to be perfect to do this, right? But if you can win the outside foot battle and you can then split the center of gravity with your footwork and you can split the center line of Usman and he constantly has to circle off and he constantly has to take a back step and he constantly has to make his way out of that back tram line in the octagon, back to the middle of the cage, back to the middle of the cage, back to the middle of the cage. If uh, Leon Edwards can force that pressure, then when Usman overcommits, it's going to be even more obvious that he's going to commit because because he's under pressure, whether that's a level change, whether that's a shot, whether that's whatever. And I think the other side of this, and one thing that will help the striking, is Leon stuffed some of those takedowns. And again, that relays back to the confidence part, right? If he stuffs some takedowns, he knows he can do it. And if he knows he can do it, well, then you've got the confidence to move into that pressure because he might get you down. He might do. What did what did Volkanovsky say? He's going to take me down. Absolutely. But I'm going to get back up, though. I think it's such an interesting fight because like where uh, you mentioned it, they were hot off the heels of, of Jones versus Gagne. And uh, that was a fight we thought could go in many different ways. But 
I think if we thought, look, if John Jones can take him down early and if he can keep continue to take him down, he's going to win. If Gagne can keep him on the feet, he's a great chance to win. This is different because, like, can Edwards take him down? Can Usman take him down? Can Edwards win in the feet? Can Usman win in the feet? Can Edwards win in the clinch? Can Usman win? It's just there's so many different integers to win the fight in so many different ways that we broke it all down here, but we can't give you an answer. Like, yeah, and the answer will happen on Saturday night at half ten English time when they close that door and when they go in there and fight. And you know what? We'll be uh, we'll be here to watch and I'm looking forward to it. Let's touch on a few of the other fights because I think we've, we've covered that one pretty well now and, you know, we'll probably pick our winners at some stage, but uh, maybe not now is, is, is the time to do that. I want to touch on Christian Leroy Duncan and for people as well, if you're looking on the short dog here, there's Chris Duncan and Christian Leroy Duncan. So we're going to talk about Christian Leroy Duncan, the middleweight who's fighting Dusko Tatarovic. Uh, so Christian Leroy Duncan has seven and a half people don't know him, the Cage Warriors middleweight champion, um, and he's had a lot of fights as well as an amateur. So he's not a guy who's only you know had seven fights and he's only a uh, you know a wet week into his career. He's had a lot of experience at the IMAS, at the amateurs as well. And I've watched uh, you know probably all of those seven fights. I, I would uh, I would garner by now or most of them at least. Um, and to me, he is a special talent. He is a guy who has the technique, he has the finishing ability, he has the athleticism, he has a good crew behind him, a good gym and all of that. Um, and I'm very excited to see this fight. Now, he fighting Dusko Tatarovic, who's a good fighter, you know, 12-3, and three, a good record uh, in the UFC, who can hit hard, who can knock people out. And we've seen this for the up-and-coming UK fighters for... A long time, you know, we've seen him getting tough matchups. Like the likes of Jack Shore has gotten tough matchups. Uh, the likes of Jai Herbert, Jai Herbert more than anyone has gotten really, really tough matchups. And this is another one here, you know, to start off your career against Todorovic, I think is a tough matchup. In my opinion, he's well able for. What are your thoughts of uh, no a tough matchup for most people? Maybe not necessarily a tough matchup for Christian Here, I don't But what are your thoughts on, on Christian Here, I don't the, the the Cage Warriors middleweight champion? I feel like this is the perfect. I- could be. It feels like this is the map that I would be giving to many fighters who are looking to get to the highest level in MMA. That's getting yourself to a camp where there it, it may not be the biggest camp in the world, but it's got some knowledgeable coaches and some good people on the map. And there is somebody above you from an overarching perspective, directing your career in a way that will produce the results for you in the long run. He had 750,000 amateur fights, right? And in those amateur fights, he took some losses. He did a ton of wins, loads of IMAF competition. So we know 100% that he's fighting good level guys. He's not fighting a guy that they've brought in, you know, just to fill a ticket on a show and he's just whacked them. He is fighting good guys in those wins. He is winning with a variety of different things, whether that's decisions, submissions, knockouts, whatever. And then he drops himself into cage warriors. And again, cage warriors, we know, especially in the past has been the premier route to the UFC. Ian Dean does a great job with the matchmaking. And so here we are. Christian Leroy Duncan is a fighter, fantastically fluid, very long, very rangy, very tall and fights that way, is a well able to go from very technical one jab, two jab, three jab type fighting to just wheel kicking a fella and, you know, it'd be grand for some flying knees. We've seen all of that stuff, spinning elbows. We've seen it all. That comes with a level of mastery of your own body and a level of mastery of your skill set. He's 27 years of age and he's coming into the UFC at what I would imagine to be the perfect time in a division that is absolutely rotten, right? And so I think he goes in against Todorovic, who is well happy for a war, loves to take a shot to give a shot. I feel like Christian Leroy Duncan is too elusive. He hits too hard and he has far too much variety. And this could be a very, very quick finish. Uh, Yeah, I I would tend to agree. Like his last two fights... He he fought Jatty Man eight and zero and ten and two, uh, Marin Dimitriov and Jatty Man was the champion at the time in Cage Warriors. And I remember watching him. He came into Cage Warriors and fought for a title, if I'm not mistaken. His first Cage Warriors fight, and I picked him in that fight. And I, uh, people were kind of saying, "Oh, why'd you pick him?" Because I watched these fights before, and and he was really good. 
and Christian Neary Duncan finished him in the third round. Watch Manny Dimitriov. He fought a lot of fights out in Eastern Europe. Watched him. A big, strong, tough guy. Knocked him out in seconds. You know, Will Curry, very good athlete, very good up and coming, took his O away and beat him in the next one. It was a bit of a weird one. The first fight, they had a rematch and he beat him again. Justin Moore, a big, strong, muscular guy, destroyed him in a round. Like, the, you know, beat Kyle McClurkin as well, a very good fighter coming out of Ireland. A lot, just very, very good wins. He's a guy you need to keep an eye on. You really, really do. Let's move on and talk about another couple of guys. Jack Shore from, obviously, your own country in Wales. Coming off of that loss, he was supposed to have a fight a couple of months ago. Didn't happen. He's been eight months out now fighting at Macri and Amir Kani, which to me has fireworks written all over, to be honest. I think that'll be a very, very fun fight. I would massively favour Jack Shore to get the win in it. But how big is this a step to come back from a guy, you know, who was unbeaten to losing in the in the way he did? Still a top prospect, you know, as I said, a former cage warrior champion as well. It's a massive fight for Jack Shore to get back on track here, isn't it? It is. And I, you know, you always say that we should speak our mind. I feel like Jack Shaw was exposed against Ricky Simon. And what I mean by exposed is there's a level of athleticism that you need and a level of power that you need to be able to compete at the highest of high echelons of this sport. And we saw in that fight, I would say Jack Shaw skill for skill is a better fighter than Ricky Simon. But Ricky Simon was like, yeah, yeah, grand eat this right hand, my friend. And Jack Shaw loses his first fight. He's also going up to 145. Now, he's not a big hitter at 135. Uh, He's not the most elusive on the feet. He is a guy that is grindy, gritty, very, very, very strong grappler. Now, that plays into his hands very well here because Macron will run across the cage and do a, a, a flying knee to begin with, almost certainly get taken down, and then we'll see some grappling things on the ground. But I do fear for Jack Shaw, or not fear, but I have some questions for Jack Shaw's 145 pound career. The weight cut will be far easier for him. But where does that extra power come from? Where does that extra muscle come from? Where does the extra athleticism come from? Because he wasn't a big bantamweight, right? You saw him against Ricky Simon. And again, Ricky was a bigger man. So when we move up to 145, what does that look like? I'm very interested in in that when we when when we get to the the, the fights on Saturday night. That's the key for me as well. Uh, I don't know. Do I like that? I I think he was good at bantamweight. Now maybe there's. I uh, wasn't there. Was it Jack Shore that there was? No, who was it? It was someone that said a problem with like water retention or something. Nathaniel Wood. Nathaniel Wood. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So, yeah, yeah maybe it was the way it cut. Maybe it was something like that. So it'll be interesting to see. I. I I don't uh, you use the word exposed. I don't think Mac Guan Americani is the type of guy to expose Jack Shore or any of the else problems. So we will see. Although he is strong, and if he gets the fight to the ground himself, very strong there. But you'd fancy Jack Shore to win that one. Uh, two more people I want to talk. Right, first of all, in a word, who wins, Gaethje or Fiziev? Fiziev. Yeah, I would tend to agree. And the last two people I want to touch on are two undefeated fighters, two flyweight fighters. And I, my question for you: Who? Is who Keeps the win streak going. Who gets to a title shot first? Mohamed Makayev or Casey O'Neill? Both of those divisions after the title fights we've seen recently, they're wide open. Both of them are probably like mid to lower ranked now in the top 15. First of all, can you see both of them getting there? And do you think they'll do it quick? Because it seems like both of them are on the, the path to do it quick. Especially, look, Casey O'Neill's fighting Jennifer Maya here. So if she wins that, she can't be too far away. I think I have big questions for both. Obviously, Casey O'Neill's been out for a year and and a little, right? Just over a year and change. And so who knows what she comes back looking like. If she goes out, I think Jennifer Meyer is quite a nice matchup for Casey O'Neill, right? We'll we'll exchange the grappling. Um, We'll be happy to do some of that. Isn't the biggest hitter. uh, Takes a shot, right? Is available for things like leg kicks and, and whatever, whatever. So if she comes out and looks anything like She's looked in her previous fights. We could see her vault into a big spot here. I think based on the the sort of the divisional depth and also the types of people that they are, I can see Casey O'Neill getting to a title shot first because we're looking at Makayev and it's a Malcolm Gordon fight now. If he beats Gordon, it's then probably a top 10, maybe a top eight fighter. Then it'll be a top five, top three fighter. Then it'll be a title shot. He's, a, he's actually fighting Jafel Filo. 
Del Filo, that's right. Yeah, I'm an yeah. idiot. <laughs> like, was, was, was it supposed to be? He was supposed to be, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. or they were calling each other out and it didn't end up happening or something. Yeah, yeah so, it's, so I, I don't know that much about that Filo guy, to be me. honest, but. I like what for me on uh, uh, on uh, Mikhaev, and I don't know if you agree or not. He actually he fought Malcolm Gordon the last time. That's what you're thinking of. That's yeah, right, yeah, that's I remember right. him. Um, Mikhaev to me was like too cocky, too overconfident in a weird way in his most recent fights. And I'm like, you're a great fighter. Go out there and smash a guy, and didn't do your dancing, and didn't do your talking, and didn't do. Like, <clears throat> I feel like it's like he's trying to copy Habib a little bit or trying to copy Shemaev a little bit. It's like, don't do that. Don't do that. You're at a level now where you're very young in your career, very young in your life, and you're going to be fighting some of the top guys in the world very, very soon if you win that. You need to cut that out of your game because, to me, I see championship level in him. So I'm not being negative here about Mikhaev or anything. I'm being like, here, lad, stop this shite. You need to be the best fighter in the world. Is that something you saw as well? Like, Because he has it all. Because he can strike, he can hit, his wrestling is unbelievable. And look, I think there needs to be a little bit of improvements everywhere, especially, I think, the the, the, the striking, but also like the... Um, how mad he is with everything in, ter- in terms of not just like the talking and not going mad, but like... Maybe it's too raw. Maybe he's too loose at times. I think for America or for uh, why do you keep calling him America? Any for Makayev, is the limit? Is there any limit? Is there any ceiling? If he looks like he looked against Malcolm Gordon, yes, there's a limit. Um, but he spoke about this publicly. To be fair to him, a couple of weeks after that Malcolm Gordon fight, he came out and he said that was way closer than it should have been. I fucked up. I was chatting. I was doing whatever. I was playing up to the crowd. I was doing all the entertainment thing. I know now I'm just going to go in and, and, and smash dudes. That's a good now, you, can, you can say that right now. We need to see it. Right. And I think for Makayev with that entertainment type side of him, I think we have to remember he's 22 years of age. Like what sort of human were we at 22? Dickheads is the answer, right? We're still we had, dickheads. <laughs> we had no idea what the fuck we were doing. Right. I'm still down. But like we weren't even sure of who we were as people, what we liked, what we wanted from life. And so I think we have to cut him a little bit of slack. He's just learning on the job. Right. We're watching a kid grow up. And so he's going to make some mistakes. You know, he's going to say some things he shouldn't say or do some things he shouldn't do and whatever. And we have to give him a bit of a wide berth there, depending on what it is. But I would be very interested to see how the next two or three years pan out. Because for Mikhaev, I agree with you, he's got a bit of everything. His sort of raw base is unbelievably strong. But when this kid hits 27 and starts to become a man and he fills out a little bit and his muscles become a bit stronger and he can hit a little bit harder and he's got all this technical prowess underneath him, if he's not already a champion or has already been a champion, by God, is he going to be absolutely destroying some fellas. And so... Jafel Filo, again, we don't know a ton about him. I, it's very likely Mohammed goes out, puts on a show, destroys this dude, and then calls out a whoever, right? Yeah, it's very interesting. Like, I think Leron Murphy, that his fight hasn't been made yet. Maybe by the time this comes out, the, the fight will uh, will have been made, or maybe he'll be off the card, whatever. Like, he's a guy to me who is. I think championship level potential as well. I'm looking forward to seeing him. I know you spoke to him a few weeks ago as well. A very, very, very good fighter. Sam Patterson is coming in here fighting as well. You know, Chris Duncan, who had a tough time with contender series and all that weirdness. You know, Jake Hadley as well, bouncing back here, who had a loss recently, but he's... Massive uh, questions. Ma- Massive big questions. questions. And he's fighting Malcolm Gordon. That You know, that's that's where you're going to win. He's fighting oh. Malcolm Gordon, so that's interesting. And also, Jai Herbert, Ludovic Klein. I love that fight, to be honest. I think that's a good fight and a better fight for uh, for Jai Herbert. I think, after all, he's been put through recently. So, do you know what? We said at the start, maybe, ah, oh, we didn't get what we kind of wanted. But do you know what this is? This is like an old-school British MMA card where there's a lot, all the talent nearly, that is up and coming, that are, the hardcores are excited for. And then a big title fight at the top, and you can't complain about that too much. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. I know you're uh, looking forward to possibly being in attendance uh, at it and watching it as well. And there's Cage Warriors the night before. So a big... Um, is there Cage Warriors the night before? There is, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, there is. Okay. Um, so yeah, that should be fun. Harry, thank you very much for joining me. I appreciate you. If you haven't followed me, follow him at BJJ underscore Harry Powell over on Twitter and uh, we will leave it at that. My name is Sean Sheehan for Shardog.com and I'll see you all next time.